this, just wave your hands. Uh, so, um, I'm delighted to be here. I've been uh, studying and writing about Hobbes for about 10 years. Um, and while I knew that I did not know everything that there was to know, I was pretty sure that I understood his views on toleration, in part because there's a sense in which, as we'll see, he's very straightforward about them. Um, but this opportunity has given me cause to revisit Hobbes on the issue, and um, I have come up with a very different conclusion than the one that I originally started with. And I promised myself that um, I would not give a talk defending Hobbes, um, because that's pretty much what I've done for 10 years, right? You hate Hobbes. Everybody hates Hobbes. Let me tell you why Hobbes is more interesting and challenging than you think he is. Um, I swore I wasn't going to do this, that, uh, do that this time, but I kind of am. Um, and I was, and I was led there, kind of, I think, by the arguments themselves, and I am very open to being persuaded. Otherwise, this is very much a work in progress, and I look forward to hearing you know, questions and comments and suggestions for how I might develop the project. So, um, the question of religious toleration was often a matter of life or death in Hobbes and Locke's time. The Edict of Nantes may have officially ended the famed wars of religion that plagued, plagued France throughout the 16th century, and indeed, it succeeded in preventing further egregious acts of religious violence on the scale of the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre of 1572. However, religious minorities were still subjected to abuse and discrimination, and the prolifer proliferation of increasingly antagonistic Christian sects that began with the Reformation and Counter-Reformation continued to plague early modern Europe. Religious persecution, the use of force against a person or a group on the basis of their religion, ran rampant. It included both legal penalties, arrest, imprisonment, exile, fines, loss of property, um, corporal punishment, execution, and execution persecution by non-state actors, including churches, their representatives, and those acting in the name of quote-unquote true religion, with states sometimes all too willing to permit or simply turn a blind eye to attacks committed by others. The ensuing violence decimated Europe and pleas for toleration, often meaning little more than the cessation of active persecution gained currently. A throng of philosophical and intellectual voices took up the question of toleration in medieval and early modern Europe. Of the many political and philosophical players in 17th century England, two of the most famous combatants are Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. Indeed, the disagreement between the Hobbesian anti-tolerationist and the Lockean tolerationist is not only notable for its role in these wider debates, it has in some sense become definitive of it. As arguments for toleration have been taken up and embraced by increasingly diverse multicultural liberal societies, Locke remains the foremost champion of toleration, and Hobbes remains the defeated nemesis. This is not to discount the importance of other thinkers, and there were many powerful defenses of toleration were given by the likes of Milton, Moore, Spinoza, various levelers, um, but I'll focus here on Hobbes and Locke, although there's a lot of interesting things to be said about how Hobbes on my reading compares with some of these other thinkers. You can only do so much in an hour though. So, in this paper, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do, then I'm going to do it. As philosophers tend to go about their business. Um, so, I trace the well known contours of the debate between Locke and Hobbes. I first want to give a very brief overview of Locke's argument as he lays it out in the letter concern, concerning toleration. And I then turn to address the reason why Hobbes is view has frequently been seen as radically insufficient from a contemporary perspective. Hobbes easily gives the impression that he is advocating or defending the state imposition of religious uniformity, making him an apologist for the persecution of religious minorities or non-conforming religious groups. I then argue that this is a mistaken interpretation of Hobbes, and defend a reading according to which Hobbes can be understood as a radical tolerationist, though characteristically for him, one of a peculiar strike. More specifically, I suggest that ultimately the logic of the argument, of Hobbes' argument, leads to a position that emphasizes or gives priority of place to the promotion of diversity as a kind of regulation of religion. If this interpretation is correct, then it has certain interesting and important implications, not only for how we understand Hobbes in his own right, but also for how we understand his relationship to Locke, and ultimately the challenge I think they both pose to contemporary thinking about toleration. Um, but before I can get to Locke, um, let me pause. 
I want to begin by um, giving a really brief overview of what was um, one of the most uh, common arguments in favor of religious persecution that was um, commonly held at this time. So the first, so two quotations on the handout. Um, I, I want to say don't read ahead, but I know that that would be useless. Um, so the first, the first two quotations on the handout uh, illustrate a, what we could call a case for religious persecution, or if we were to put it more nicely, we could call it a case for enforcement of religious orthodoxy. Um, so advocates of uh, persecution in England made use of these, these kinds of arguments. Uh, since the conditions of salvation are known, and the thing that matters most to anyone is whether or not he or she will be saved, it is evidently right and proper to bring sinners to salvation by any means possible. It's not persecution but charity to prevent people from imperiling their immortal souls. This is the point of quotation number two. Um, John Shafto, who says in 1673, he, I, I love this quotation, he is not only by his private conscience, but public engagement obliged. For he who sees another man in his opinion blind, and going directly upon a pit or precipice, where he shall be sure to pitch upon his own death, is very much to blame if he does not hinder him from running thus foolishly to his destruction. Since people are sinning either out of ignorance or out of bravado, they lose nothing by being made to conform to the true faith. Compulsion could be mild, um, fines, um, like a sin of hippo advocates moderate living, um, or more severe, whatever it takes um, in order to stop people from going over the precipice. Now remember, at the bottom of the precipice is actually not just um, ground, but the eternal torment of hell. So whatever you need, if you, if you see somebody going blindly towards a precipice, you are obliged to stop them, right? That's not persecution, that's charity, right? It's not supererogatory, it's in a sense obligatory. And if the heretics are obstinate, then as Aquinas tells us, the world is made better off with their elimination. <clears throat> you can see how if you thought that the way to salvation was known, um, this kind of argument would be compelling on the face of it. But in order to justify the state enforcing religious orthodoxy, not just um, churches or individuals uh, saving each other from going over cliffs, which in order to justify the state enforcing religious orthodoxy and enacting strict penalties for heresy, the same kind of argument, the kind of argument of true believers was used, but it was combined with the claim that it was the proper role of the state to enforce such orthodoxy, though, and here's the catch, the political ruler should consult the experts, i.e. those versed in religious truths, to find out what God required. So to find out how to stop the person from going over the cliff. Um, we can figure out what God requires of us, uh, and the business of the state was to see that the true doctrines were taught and anything hostile was suppressed. The rulers should consult those best informed on these matters, priests, theologians, councils of the church. Um, and take their word for it. And private individuals ought to be grateful for not having to figure it out for themselves. They could simply follow the guidance of the learned clergymen codified through the laws of the sovereign. Right? So the individual on the story should be grateful for not having to worry about the possible pits or precipices around because he or she can be secure that their political ruler have consulted with the relevant experts and so are enacting the laws necessary to save your soul. Takes anxiety out of the one, one uh, out of the individual experience of religion. <clears throat> so that's the, or at least one of the common um, justifications for persecution or anti-tolerationist argument. You'll see that um, Locke is clearly opposed to this, but um, even on an anti-tolerationist reading of Hobbes, this is not the argument. Offer, but this was one of the ones that was on offer. So, Locke in a nutshell. Um, and I know that uh, many of you in the seminar have been studying Locke's letter, so um, much of this will be familiar. A um, little bit of uh, 
political stage that in, um, after the restoration of the English monarchy and the Church of England in 1660, a new series of measures called the Clarendon Code were passed that provided for the enforcement of religious orthodoxy and the persecution of members of dissenting religions. So in 1660, the monarchy and the Church of um, England was, were restored, and these measures called the Clarendon Code were passed um, that brought the issue of toleration back up again because they provided for um, persecution of dissenters. Very briefly, the Clarendon Code was a series of four legal statutes passed between 1661 and 1665 that effectively reestablished the supremacy of the Anglican Church after the interlude of Cromwell's Commonwealth and ended toleration for dissenting religions. So the first statute was known as the Corporation Act, 1661, which required all municipal officials to take Anglican communion. This effectively excluded nonconformists from public office. So nonconformists or dissenters is sometimes kind of the general term to refer to anybody who wasn't an Anglican. Um, so what this would look like now is that you would have to take communion of a certain sort, of a specific church, in order to work for the government. Okay, that was the first act of the Clarendon Code. The second act, the Act of Uniformity, made the use of the Book of Common Prayer compulsory in religious service. Um, so you had to use a certain book during um, your religious services. More than 2,000 clergy refused to comply, and they all lost their jobs. Um, the Conventicle Act, 1664, forbade conventicles. So conventicles were defined as um, more than five people who weren't in the same household meeting um, in order to engage in unauthorized worship. Um, so that act forbade meeting meetings of more than five people um, engaged in unconventional worship unless you were related to each other. Uh, finally, the Five Mile Act of 1665, and I, this one's my favorite. I know, to the extent that you can have favorites of such things, this is my favorite aspect of the Clarendon Code, the Five Mile Act, forbade nonconformist ministers from coming within five miles of incorporated towns or teaching in their schools. Right, so, so what that meant was that if you were a member, of, uh, if you weren't a member of of England, if you were a minister of one of the other religions, you couldn't come within five miles of an incorporated town. That was not repealed until 1812, by the way. So, in short, the Clarendon Code effectively ended any possibility of the Anglican Church and the nonconformists coming together under one religious and social banner. It was in this context that Locke developed his theories regarding toleration. And it's interesting that. Um, so Locke wrote a lot about toleration. His views changed drastically over time. Like he went from P to not P. So in the early 1660s, um, he writes the two tracts, uh, which are um, an argument in opposition to toleration. And actually, his claims are relatively Hobbesian there in the beginning of the 1660s. Um, the letter concerning toleration, and kind of over 20 years later gives an entirely different story. There you find this famous impassioned defense of toleration. And there's a lot of interesting ways to speculate about what happened in between, why did he change his mind so radically. Um, but likely part was his experience of the imposition of intolerance that happened under the Clarendon Code that made him change his mind. There is a lot to say about the evolution and transformation of Locke's thinking, um, but his mature views and the ones for which he's so famous are contained in the letter concerning toleration, so I want to give a brief overview of the main arguments he advances there. And I'm going to give it an overview in a way that will help me juxtapose him with Hobbes. So this is not an attempt to do a le justice to a letter concerning toleration. Um, so uh, Locke's first um, claim is that what he calls the duty of the civil magistrate, this is number three on your handout. The duty of the civil magistrate extends only to civil interest, which include life, liberty, health, and indulgency of body, and the possession of outward things, such as money, lands, houses, furniture, and the like. The duty of the magistrate, life, liberty, and furniture. Um, his duty, as Locke tells us, neither can nor ought in any manner to be extended to the salvation of souls. The magistrate's power extends not to the establishing of any articles of faith or forms of worship by the force of his laws. So the force of law, Locke argues, can't be used to affect anyone's civil interests, like liberty property, 
religion, and the religious sphere, concern for salvation of souls, is given completely over to churches, which Locke defines as voluntary societies of men joining themselves together of their own accord in order to the public worshiping of God in such a manner as they judge acceptable to him and effectual to the salvation of their souls. So churches are voluntary um, associations of men who agree in matters of faith. It's very important that they're voluntary and they're based on an intellectual agreement. Um, in the same way that the civil magistrate has no jurisdiction over anyone's spiritual interests, their interest in salvation, churches don't have any jurisdiction over anyone's civil interests. Locke contends that states cannot legitimately use their power, which is the force of law, to coerce religious belief or practice. Similarly, the power of churches consists in laying down minimal rules for what counts as worship in that church, and so determining membership, and also excommunicating those who do not conform. And churches cannot legitimately use this power to interfere with people's civil interests. Churches are not allowed to impose on the lives, liberties, or property of their members, those who have been excommunicated, or those who are not members. This, this, uh, this separation of church and state is it has come to me now and has serious practical implications for what churches could do. So when a church excommunicated you, Locke is arguing, it's not allowed to also take your property. So now, Locke gives a number of arguments for the strict separation, the duties of the magistrate versus the duties of churches. Some are directed at Christians in general, some at zealots, Called zealots, some at magistrates, some at established churches, some at private individuals. Indeed, the letter concerning toleration is just a series of these arguments. And though some are tailored at one audience more than another, there are recurring themes. First and foremost, he emphasizes the impossibility and irrationality of coercing genuine religious belief. The state's tool is coercion, right? The use of force or the threat of the use of force, and force is incapable of affecting a genuine inward persuasion of the mind is exactly what's necessary for salvation, Locke thinks. Coercion thus simply cannot be employed for salvation. It's just the wrong tool for the job in every sense. So from the perspective of the would-be persecutor, um, it's irrational to use force in matters of religion because force cannot affect a sincere change of heart or mind. Forcing people to profess what they do not believe comes down to forcing them to lie in an especially perspicuous and pointed passage, which would be number four, um, Locke addresses those who argue in favor of forcing non-believers to profess the true religion. And he says, A sweet religion indeed, that obliges men to disassemble and tell lies, both to God and man, for the salvation of their souls. If the magistrate thinks to save men thus, he seems to understand little of the way of salvation. And if he does it not in order to save them, why is he so solicitous about the articles of faith as to enact them by law? So you can see Locke applying to the kind of Shafto argument and saying, um, look, you think that you're stopping people from going over cliffs at the bottom of which lies eternal torment, but you're not because if you force them to profess something they don't believe, you're forcing them to lie to God. That doesn't get you to heaven. God doesn't like it when you lie. But in really simple terms. Um, Locke's kind of central uh, premise is that we can't be coerced or terrified into experiencing genuine, a genuine change of heart, and since a genuine change of heart is the only way to achieve the church's true aim, the salvation, um, churches must limit their, message, their methods to persuasion, not coercion. Thus, the goal at which churches aim cannot be separated from the methods that they employ. Moreover, Locke argues from the perspective of the persecuted, right? So, so one of the arguments is to the would-be persecutor, right? It's irrational and self-defeating for, for you to persecute people in order to save their souls. But he also talks to those who are being persecuted. Um, and he says it's irrational to follow the directives of someone else on religious matters. That other person might well be wrong about what or is not pleasing to God. And either way, if you don't genuinely believe following someone else in action, even if they are right, is not a way to get into what Locke calls the mansion of the blessed, mansions of the blessed heaven. Um, so lying doesn't get you into heaven. Um, if the magistrate steps outside his proper sphere and commands a person to do something against his or her conscience, like, for example, use the Book of Common Prayer, um, 
he or she should dis subject should disobey the command, but yield to the punishment that, it, that accompanies the act of breaking the law. At the time, this was called um, the doctrine of passive resistance, the doctrine of passive disobedience. The idea was that you disobey the offensive command, but you accept the punishment. And it was a familiar move within these debates about toleration, or specifically what debates about what to do if you were commanded to do something that you thought was a sin. Um, so, and there's a sense in which this argument for the legitimacy of disobeying commands that require you to violate your conscience as long as you accept the resulting punishment arguably provides a foundation for the right of revolution in Locke's second treatise of government, where he suggests that religious reasons are one possible justification for overthrowing a government. So, in sum, uh, religious persecution for the sake of converting people is not only bound to fail, but it's self-defeating. You simply cannot save people's souls using coercion. X cannot save Y's soul using force, and X, and, sorry, X cannot save Y's soul using, using force, and Y cannot have her soul saved by X if she gives into the force. I think you should use X and Y in every paper, even if it doesn't add anything. No, not really, but that's what I just did. Um, so no doubt. Um, one could easily offer a rich, rich lecture, I'm not going to, on the precise details of Locke's argument, not to mention the interpretive debates that have arisen about them, and the deep entrenching criticisms that have been offered. However, that would lead us far afield of the central issues I wish to address. For my purposes, I, will, I, want, to, I want to mention two of what I take to be the most damning objections to Locke's view. First, Locke explicitly denies that Catholics and atheists need to be tolerated. And second, his defense of toleration seems to proceed from exclusively prudential grounds rather than from any genuine respect for religious freedom. As Jeremy Waldron recently argued, echoing a claim made by one of Locke's own contemporaries, Locke offers only instrumental reasons to respect religious difference. As a result, this approach seems to appear unpalatable today, even to those who share Locke's overall commitment to religious toleration. Um, of course, the first objection is more easily explained, if not excused, by reference to the issues that were in the air during the time in which Locke was writing. Most of the 17th century English defenders of toleration did not defend the claim that atheists should be tolerated. Um, where exceptions can be found in the writings of members of a minority of radical Protestant groups, just as the seekers and the lovers. Um, but most people advocating toleration were not advocating extending toleration to atheists. Um, so the exclusion of atheists doesn't distinguish Locke from his contemporaries. More importantly, the issue, there's a sense in which the issue just wasn't on the table politically or philosophically. Um, those observations do not in any way, of course, excuse Locke on the issue, but they're important to keep in mind. The exclusion of Catholics is a little harder to make sense of. Locke justifies excluding them on the grounds that they ultimately owe their obedience to a foreign power, namely the Pope in Rome. Um, on this point, it's, noticing, it's worth noting that many in England at this time were, and perhaps not unreasonably so, afraid that England might soon become a Catholic country. Charles II had been rumored to have made a secret promise to the Pope that he would convert to Catholicism, and the line of succession threatened to install a Catholic on the English throne. This worry gave rise to the exclusion crisis and the glorious revolution. Again, this does not excuse Locke's refusal of toleration to Catholics. It only explains why, explains why it might have made sense for him to make such a claim. In my view, if we look only to the logic of Locke's arguments, there's likely no principled ground for excluding either Catholics or atheists. He's not committed to excluding them, and their exclusion is not intrinsic to the essence or structure of his argument. Um, there is debate over that, but I'm not going to push it here. More concerning, however, and more relevant, relevant for us, is the second objection that, from a contemporary perspective, in which the basic respect for religious freedom is the defining feature of the ideology of liberal democracy and human rights. It remains true that Locke's defense of toleration seems to draw on what, what philosophers sometimes call the wrong kinds of reasons. Um, so there's good reason to, so that draws on prudential reasons, um, instrumental reasons, rather than any genuine respect for religious freedom. So while there's good reason to treat Locke as an important forefather to more contemporary theories of toleration, there's also an important sense in which he has suffered the fate that all so-called forefathers tend to suffer. He was a product of his time, and in hindsight, the shortcomings of his view are rapidly brought into sharp relief. So that's uh, Locke in a nutshell, um, uh, by way of comparing and contrasting him to Hobbes, who, who wrote uh, Leviathan before 
uh, before even like, uh, the English Latin was written before the French and Um So I want to first present to you the kind of re reading of the text where Hobbes is uh, a religious authoritarian. Um, so on a natural reading of Leviathan, Hobbes seems to disagree with Locke at every significant juncture. Whereas Locke advocates strict separation of church and state, Hobbes insists on the opposite, rendering the church subordinate to the state, um, arguing that that's not only desirable, but actually necessary. More specifically, Hobbes was a proponent of Erastianism, the view that churches were completely subordinate to the political ruler, that the state is supreme in religious matters. You can see that that's an inversion of the kind of traditional um, justifications for toleration, or sorry, for persecution that said the political ruler had to consult with the churches to find out what God wanted. Um, Hobbes was an Erastian, which meant he, he thought that the churches were subordinate to the political ruler. Whereas Locke denied that the civil magistrate ever has the right to prescribe particular forms of religious worship, Hobbes argues that it is an essential right of sovereignty to regulate public discourse about religion, politics, and morality. He argues that the sovereign has the right and duty to exercise extensive control over what doctrines are expressed, published, and taught. And he expressed what doctrines and opinions are published, what doctrines and opinions are expressed, and what doctrines and opinions are taught. The central right of sovereignty is to control every single one of those things. If you're not familiar with Hobbes, you can might be starting to see why I say that people tend to dislike him. <laughs> um, Hobbes specifies that the right to determine which books of scripture are canonical falls to the sovereign, the right to decide how we should interpret passages in those books falls to the sovereign, and the right to give legal force to those teachings falls to the sovereign. Contra law, Hobbes explicitly affords the sovereign the right to dictate what counts as worship and require uniformity of such. Where law permits and even encourages subjects to disobey laws that conflict with their consciences, Hobbes explicitly prohibits it. Where law insists that sincere, voluntary, genuine belief is necessary for salvation, Hobbes denies it. Again, you have a P and not P, really. It seems like in every case, Locke says P, Hobbes says not P. Um, and given the issues, it's understandable that Locke has been presented as a hero of the limited one and Hobbes as villain. Um, so, uh, so why do people think that Hobbes was such a villain? In particular, why do they think that he can be aligned with defenders of religious persecution? Well. A lot of the argument rests on one single passage, and it's passage number five. Um, and, and the argument is, Locke, or sorry, the argument is Hobbes says so. Which is a good argument. He, he seems to say so. Um, he says, public worship consisteth in uniformity. The commonwealth, and by the commonwealth, um, he means the sovereign who represents the commonwealth, shall ordain what actions and gestures to be publicly and universally in use as signs of honor and and part of God's worship are to be taken and used for such by the subjects. 